academic and it's theater, it's a place where they both meet. You have the audience and participants for each other. It started out about different people and about different things. A whole sea of phenomena. Fear for everybody, yes, everybody. That's it, that's what we've done. And in view of my understanding of my relationship to death, I've already changed. Welcome, um, everybody, to the Martin E. Siegel Theatre Center, and uh, thank you for watching the clip. I think this is the first time we uh, showed it, and uh, so um, thank you. It communicates, hopefully, a little bit what we do. My name is Frank Henschke. I'm the executive director and director of programs, founder of the festival here, and with, together with Antje Oegel, who's my co-director of programs. She's also a co-curator, and this is a wonderful moment for us because it is the official opening of the Pinball Voices Playwrights Festival, and uh, it's a great, great honor for us to participate in this most significant festival. It was created by Paul Oster and Selman Rushdie in the times of the Bush government or the Bush regime, as some say, and I would <laughs> agree. And when they felt there was a tunnel vision, uh, about over 95, 96% of all books printed um, were American writers, and uh, all the very low percentage that was left was half it was German or French because they supported it. So there was not enough voices from around the world. And we need them, they are important. In the music world, everybody knows that every great musician listens to world music. And in theater, we all have to listen more and everybody, but especially also New York, even though it is such a great cosmopolitan city, a little bit is missing, but it also is a city that, as it shows with you all coming here, it is really interested. So thank you, thank you all uh, for coming. We have some of the playwrights already here. E Ivor is from uh, Croatia, who is here, Laura from uh, South, maybe you wave, uh, South Africa. And with us also is Yudai, the writer um, of the play right now from Japan. They all flew in just for this festival. And again, it's a, a great, um, great honor. And we would like to thank the Japan Foundation um, also for their support. And uh, Niki Hata is here with us. So thank you for making this uh, extravaganza uh, happen. Thank you very much. And um, I, uh, a few words of the Siegel Center at British Academia and Professional Theatre International at the American Theatre, so this festival really is at the center of what we do. Normally the speech is a little bit shorter, but it is the beginning of the festival, and uh, if you have a, a cell phone, just take it out for one moment and see if it's uh, sound off. <laughs> now I'm gonna do the same. The format is there will be the play reading followed then uh, by a discussion here. And now I would like to uh, welcome a, 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 a member of the Penn Trustee Board who uh, took her time to come to us and also say a few words on behalf of the Penn uh, World Voices and the Penn International Play Festival, Elizabeth Hammerdinger, who also is a writer herself. Elizabeth, thank you so much uh, for coming. and. Uh, also, again, um, it's a great, great honor. This is the greatest literary festival, I think, in the city of New York, and for us to be now part of it for over 10 years, uh, and which now became the most significant, we think, festival for playwrights uh, from uh, global uh, reach uh, in the US, perhaps even in all the Americas. So it's a, it's a great, great honor, and I'm mean, so glad that we continued to work with you. Thank you. We agree with you. Thank you. <laughs> we are recording it, so that's how we <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, so for the recording, um, hello, welcome to New York for you who've just flown in and welcome here for those of you who live in New York. My name is Elizabeth Hammerdinger. I'm here as a trustee of Penn America. I'm also a playwright, so it's a particular honor to be connected to this part of the festival. On behalf of the 4,400 writers, translators, and editors of Penn, it's our great pleasure to welcome you to the 12th annual, did you say 10th? Yeah, we were part of it for 10, but it, it is Okay, so, but we're at our 12th year oh, annual festival 
uh, World Voices Festival of International Literature. Uh, I'm going to tell you just a little about Penn um, because we're very proud of what we've been thinking about. We're an organization that stands at the intersection of literature and human rights to protect open expression at home and abroad. We champion the freedom to write, recognize the power of the word to transform the world. Our mission is to unite writers and their allies to celebrate creative expression and defend the liberties that make it possible. Penn America is the largest branch of a global organization, Penn International, of writers active, active in more than 100 countries. We work on behalf of jailed and threatened writers, fight against surveillance, and put on provocative literary programming. So they'd ask me to just say a little bit about my own connection, my own feelings about Penn. I love to be involved in an organization that identifies itself as provocative. And I'm so happy to identify myself with Penn's mission and its membership. Um, I, as a writer, I came up with uh, nouns uh, where reporters and entertainers were warriors, were connectors, and were comrades. And I'd like to thank the sponsors, supporters, and volunteers who make the Penn World Voices possible, Festival possible, and thank you for being part of our audience. For more information about Penn America and details on other festival events, visit PEN.org. There's lots going on all over at the moment. Or visit uh, the information table outside to learn about becoming a member today and receive a discount when you join in, per in person. We welcome your membership. We're expanding our reach and activities and would love for you to be part of it, so please sign up for our newsletter at the very least like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. We try to be provocative and outspoken. <laughs> I'd also like to take a moment to draw your attention to our exceptional closing event for the festival this year. We're delighted and honored to have the author of An Untamed State and Bad Feminist. That's the title of the book, not the <laughs> author's name. Roxanne Gay, uh, who will be delivering the Arthur Miller Freedom to Write lecture on Sunday, May 1st at 6 p.m. at the Cooper Union. As a, and it's a wonderful venue. If you haven't been, it's just worth the journey and then to hear Roxanne, Roxanne will be fabulous. As a cultural critic and social media powerhouse, Roxanne writes with prodigious bravery about gender, sexuality, and race. Following the lecture, she will be in conversation with poet Saeed Jones, BuzzFeed's executive cultural editor. We hope to see you there. Again, thank you for coming today. Thank you to our guests for agreeing to take part in what I'm sure will be a wonderful event and break a leg. <laughs> themselves, digging through the underground, lighting new bombs. The din was enough. By then, the city was barely holding on, almost having absorbed <coughs> as much noise as it possibly could. And in a building that I did not build, that felt sterile, I slept as I basked in the sunlight. As I recall, I was alone. Perhaps I'd been awakened by my own snores, but I felt as if someone had shaken my shoulder. I awoke, and then I saw that I was in a room in the terribly stained building where there once was a kimono shop in Chuoku, in Tokyo. And in this room, there was fresh evidence that the care carelessly placed mattress had been dusted off. My drool had left a yellow stain which stank, so I felt as if I was looking at my own stupid sleeping face. There was no music playing in my mind. It felt terribly empty, and then only silence. 
Silence is not the incidental gap between words. They say it possesses a force against words. The elderly man stands, his left hand nestled in his pocket as if guarding his words against silence. He has trouble bending his right leg, but steam from the residual heat of silence is spit out of his palm when he opens and closes his right hand. <coughs> The rising white steam smooths out the wrinkles on his face, giving a glimpse of his former youth on the other side of silence. What's the use of indulging this silence, I think, and get up, and I'm bewildered to find a man known as the father of Mexican theater standing right next to me. <laughs> uh, hello. Do I accept the fact that he is the father of Mexican theater? The fact that he is the father of Mexican theater makes whether or not this makes sense to me meaningless. He is who he is, that's right. I thought I would speak to this Mexican. I can't think of what to talk about. I don't know whether since he is a theater person I should talk to him about theater, or I should talk about the weather first, the way one would serve tea and cake to, to a guest first, or perhaps I should introduce myself. I am actually also involved in theater. I am ostensibly a theater director, so that would make me a pretty low, bottom-of-the-rung existence next to yours. But uh, to begin with, you seem to be Japanese or Chinese. But to begin with, uh, are you in my dream? That's what's going around and around in my mind. But if you are an apparition or a ghost of some kind, you'd probably be able to hear what I'm thinking inside my head without my having to articulate it. Right? That was what was going around and around in my mind. How, How do you think about theater? theater, was his sudden question. It seemed he couldn't speak Japanese with facility, and since I don't understand Spanish, he spoke to me in English. How, How do you, you think, think about, about theater? theater? Well, I don't really care about theater. <laughs> I can understand what's being said in Japanese, but it's been a while since I had to speak it, so the words don't come easily. The Mexican said something like this and stuck out his tongue. <laughs> From the late Taisho period to the early Showa period, I was in Tokyo back when they were starting to construct the winding sewers and water grew dirty as it traveled down its pathway. In Tokyo, the earth shook. Old buildings were destroyed. On the one hand, there was revolution in Germany and Russia, and I was in a panic about that. However, I did not even have an ounce of intention to flirt with aging theater folk. Rather, for the poverty-stricken masses, I went to exercise my right in the general election, along with the rice farmers and laborers packed into suitcases. I believe that the morning, a spittoon was rising imminently, and we fought for those politics, those ideals, for that society that sank like piss, for that economy that was like, that was like sleep in your eye and snot in your nose. As we took sardines over a flame, we were destroying the world created for the privileged to leave behind some shred of hope that would at least be better than shit for the next generation of bastards. That was the spirit with, with which I lived for theater. <laughs> However, this young man who fancies himself a theater director asked, Mr. Sano, when you lived in Tokyo, how long did it take for the train on the Yamanote line to complete a circle? <laughs> and? Um, what time was the last train? Like a reporter for a magazine, he repeatedly asks about the train. It's nice that he had some interest, and of course there were times when I rode the train. However, what about theater? Throughout theater, through theater, I would gaze at society with its exposed nipples, attacking the wailing politicians with my girlish passion for revolution. If I didn't do that, who would be the point of making village plays for theater's sake? Ride the train, or take a picture of the train, and grin. What would that accomplish? At least once, I'd rather bring home a young man from the shabby next door apartment who looked like he might hang himself any day and share a pot of warm stew with him, or dropped that pot so it shattered so I could give some work to someone who fixed it. I'd rather make theater that match these priceless, priceless social contributions and feel good about myself. Because then I would know how the needle and thread work underneath the fabric of society. Tear down the government, rob money from the rich, 
leftist theater is rising. Long live the protele prole proletariat. The Mexican was so excessively passionate that he was unintelligible. It was as if someone had handed me a heavy off-season blanket. He spoke heatedly, at times dragging his foot while imitating an actor. Meanwhile, I felt like I was sleep-talking. But I am also a bit of a theater director myself, involved in this charade of performance. Nobody cares about the left or proletariat art in this day and age. All they care about is themselves and their petty little worries, facades of love and empty catastrophes. There may be one small faction of self-professed intellectuals who complain about the government online, but the theater has completely lost its significance. Listen to me. <laughs> Time goes around and around, and now, is the time for you to speak out for the laborers. Tear down the government, focus your youth and your passion, <laughs> abandon catastrophe, and throw yourself into the internet. We need theater to do its work. Theater doesn't speak for anyone and can't bring down the government. Youth is useless and passion is scoffed at, and nobody believes there's a shred of truth online. Now is the time for the voice of the laborers to focus its youth and its passion abandon <coughs> catastrophe, and throw itself into the internet. We need theater, come on, say it. Now is the time for the laborers to take their youth and Terrible. passion to the internet. Terrible. I'm not an actor. Quit jabbering, take a pause between the breaths. Connect the flow of words together. Okay. Hurry up. Now is the time, and the laborers always have their youth sucked dry by the internet. Th those aren't the lines. I don't care anymore. <laughs> Being insolent and shameless, I just want to sleep. I want to end my days in slumber. I want to stop this thinking game and stay asleep. I don't want to think about society and labor and meaning. I want to float to the surface of the world and for my flimsy life to melt away in a bland soup. As if he read my mind, the theater Mexican clammed up, irritated, and dragging the left leg he couldn't bend, he runs around, glittering, like dust stirred up into the sunlight, and he shouts, my brain cells are being scratched by the sharp claws of political purveyors. He cries the cry of an exile, like a lab rat. If Mexico is like a child to he who is the father of Mexican theater, his home country of Japan must be like his mother. Oedipus, abhorred by his mother, their relationship never restored. With the resilience of a rat, he groaned, nonsense, exhausted. Afterwards, his body felt calm, and he told me the story of how he retreated from the front lines of the left-wing theater movement because of the detectives from the police department's rat control office and traveled off to Berlin and then Russia with the help of his parents, uh, the help of money. In the new world, he became an assistant to the director Meyerhold, who would be crushed to breadcrumbs. His stories from that time were so spicy, I almost fainted. The conflicting theater theories of great director Stanislavski and Meyerhold the miraculous fusion of the two legendary men flaunting their genitalia to each other as old men. These were the stories I had to listen to as if inside an eternal fire. What kind of theater was this? Isn't Stanislavski a style of scheme? When I gingerly tried to make a joke, Seki Sano, the formerly Japanese theater person who had been forced by circumstances to establish his artistic home in Mexico, made a withered expression like the end of the world, and with a lopsided skip, he disappeared. As I watched him walk away, his back seemed to say, follow me like my footsteps, footsteps and, and go, go to, to Russia. Russia. In this climate of de rapidly deteriorating US-Russian relations, which would you choose? I longed for the sun, so I decided to go to Okinawa. Okinawa. One. Naha. I headed from Narita to Okinawa. It was December. I went to Naha by myself. I didn't need a coat in Naha in early December. The airport was crowded with American military planes that were taking off and landing. The escalator leading to the airport monorail was overrun with Christmas decorations, which felt so out of season. Okinawa is always summer. Uh, what an arrogant misconception, but it's true. Okinawa should always be summer, and there should be no Christmas in the summertime in the Northern Hemisphere. Berlin was probably cold. Moscow, even colder. Tokyo was also cold. And Naha, I just needed a light jacket. I wanted dinner, so I walked to the international street, but I couldn't find a restaurant. Everything looked like a tourist spot. I couldn't make myself feel like a tourist. In the hotel alone, I drank awamori and got wasted. 
I turned the TV on and there was news that the special secrecy law had passed in the upper house. I was pretty drunk and, yes, drowsy. As I brought the last of my snacks to my mouth, I swam at the entrance to the land of dreams in the pool of hatred. Oh, I thought that old Mexican guy, Sakisano, might show up dressed like Santa Claus. <laughs> there was something I wanted to ask him, but he didn't show up. He must have been off season, you know, Christmas. The dream I was having was distorted. There was an old Japanese man who was a choreographer for a Broadway musical in my dream. It seems that he was once a dancer who'd been active overseas. His lone body, his one insignificant body, was jumping around on stage. And as I watched him, somehow I entered into him, occupying his body. My heart was heavy, and my agile body transformed into that of an asthmatic grade schooler. The more desperately I danced, the currents in my body were obstructed. And I was overcome with shame. My limbs exploded like sand and crumbled. The red fires of war were destroying the alignment of my teeth, the panic, my heart pounding. A member of the secret police dressed in tails, a marine deliberating over one menu, ceaselessly moving feet, tangled, a young man and his magic marker writing his thoughts and feelings on paper, countless prime ministers closing in with wide grins on their faces, the sweat spraying, and a reddened face on a body that cannot dance, and I tearfully beg them to stop overfishing the salmon that's given birth. Me on the internet, me in the coral reef, I am the fish cake that I eat as I kick children to death. I am surrounded by myself, and at the peak of my fright, I jump awake, drenched in sweat. And in my apartment room in Naha, there is a sweaty shirt hung up to dry, and it had been treated with fabric softener and smelled nice. Two, the Himiuri Monument. A theater critic had come to Naha. According to Twitter, he was in town to attend a friend's wedding. Come to think of it, Twitter was also how I found out about the 311 earthquake when I was in Osaka. I emailed the critic, and we decided to hang out together before the wedding. I sped off in my rental car. As I waited for the theater critic in the rundown parking lot near the monorail station, the critic appeared, arm in arm, with that old Mexican. <coughs> Hola, the old man was, was in a terrific mood, and he chattered away at the critic in Spanish. The critic, half smiling, was nodding in agreement. Um, uh, could you speak in English, please? Okay. So, my reforms put together the proposal, the memorial, and the bid. Three of Chekhov's one act farces under the title 33 Fainting Spells. Uh, in the three plays, the protagonist faints 33 times. That's a lot of fainting spells. <laughs> Each fainting spell was accompanied by live orchestration, brass for men, strings for the women, and when the character who fainted came to, that would stop the music. That was his plan. <laughs> that sounds overly dramatic. The text in Chekhov's plays require a light physicality. Uh, but when you think about that lightness, the action of fainting creates an interesting contrast. By treating the swoons as something heavy, it plays up the humor. Simply put, you could say that I learned about the inventiveness of the director's imagination, and it was a great help when it came time for me to build my own directorial vision. But is it really possible to actually discover 33 fainting spells? Yes, in the it is. Oh. If you count all the lines that indicate moments of hysterics and, and dizziness as fainting spells, that's the concept behind the direction. Oh, that seems forced. The direction seems too strong. You could say it is the director's own ego or manipulation of the script. The script is merely an ingredient, like the skin of a human. The skin. Anybody can wash the skin and make it clean. That's what I'm talking about. If you take a fresh washcloth and scrub your own body, you wash off the grime. The director doesn't allow that grime to escape. Oh, my heart hurts. The, the grime is not just grime. There, themes hidden by the author exist there. Nay, the play itself has its own unique characteristics and universality. So in order to capture all of that, you must scrub the play, at times gentle, at times more violently, to produce high-quality drive. In other words, 
as a director, you could say I am a washcloth. <laughs> <laughs> but I aim to be the highest quality possible of a washcloth, not the kind of towel that's sold to tourists. Not like you, whose only discourse is to critique. I may just be a washcloth. I want to be a washcloth with history and tradition, but a vanguard for the radical as well. Oh, oh, oh me, corazón. Uh, the memorial, the bear, the marriage proposal, I hadn't read any of them. It was a heated discussion. The December sea glistened yellow like an illusion, as if it were going to disappear. I drove. Every turn of the steering wheel was comical, just like that Chekhov play. In the passenger seat, the critic didn't even glance at the ocean because he was glued to his tablet screen. He remained clad in his dark suit, his sweat hidden as he researches Okinawa, about its history, about Hanoko, about sympathy budget allocations. Was this place a subject of research to him? About the children born of mixed Okinawan and American blood, about the many emigrants to Hawaii, etc., etc. Sano uncharacteristically leaned forward, asking all sorts of questions about the tablet, while the critic proudly showed off his control of the tablet, surprising Sano and manipulating the tablet further, continuing to surprise Sano. In the hyped air within the car, the noise made me feel joyful and gloomy, but mostly glum as I gazed out at the sea. The critic and Sano were also discussing the future of Japan, but for me, the seawater seemed more important. I want to be a fish. The two talked themselves to exhaustion and fell asleep. Snore, sigh, snore, sigh. Such peaceful faces and stupid snoring. Their sleeping faces were probably stupid as well, but I was driving. Everything can look different depending on one's awareness and interest. Things can look calm and not so. Things can look alive or already dead. Then we finally arrived at the Himeyuri Monument. The two had childlike, carefree expressions on their faces, but you need to wake up. At the Himeyuri Monument, I parted my way through crowds of students. I gave sidelong glances at the portraits of the students who had been killed there in the war 70 years ago, as if to fuel my <coughs> repugnance towards war. But there was never enough time. Even with running legs or a trot either way, I remain unable to shed tears for each and every tragedy. We have sconed our responsibility, the responsibility to accept our history. Returning to the parking lot, I turn on the ignition and grip the steering wheel. An uncomfortable, tepid wind blows. Near the Hemayuri Monument, I walk through the grounds of Peace Park. The names of the war dead glisten black. Did they starve? Were they in pain? Suicide or bombs? On the cornerstone of the memorial, I found the name of a distant relative. How did he die? A near friend is better than a far-blowing kinsman. At the museum, I saw an exhibit, a special exhibit of records of the Okinawa War and Okinawa emigrants, those who emigrated to Hawaii, Mexico, and Peru. Everything grows very distant. A strong gust blows. I open the car window, making the sleeping critic's hair flutter and his brow furrow. What kind of dream is he having? The critic's dream. The director and I went to an island called Kudakajima, about 20 minutes away by ferry from the main islands of Okinawa, where we rented bicycles and went our separate ways. This is a sacred island where it is said that the Okinawan gods resided. It was cloudy. The island is long and narrow. No matter how much I pedal, I don't seem to be moving forward. In the groves near the sandy beaches, bananas grow. My bicycle is rusty and I begin to feel like I'm being tortured, so I thought I'd stop at a shop near the harbor and grab a bike. And at that moment, a man lurking behind me who looked exactly like the director <coughs> or rather, who was the director himself, struck my head with a hard rock or something. I felt something warm on my head, but for some reason I didn't feel pain. A warm liquid blood or brain flowed down my face and enveloped my body, and then spread laterally, absorbing the scent of the ground. I groaned. 
as I gripped the dirt, and somehow I noticed two presences, the irritated director and the peaceful director. But perhaps it was the presence of the gods, the source of the scent of the air, or those who worship those deities. The travel required to return to our ancestors, the home we need to return to in order to sleep. Both have been lost. Mr. Sun announces that he will well, accompany the young director, the young director on his visit. visit to a relative who lives in Nago. So I must part ways. Goodbye. Three, Ogimi Village, formerly Hanoko. My relative in Nago told me where the ancestral <coughs> grave was, so I went to pay my respects nearby in Ogimi. It was an unfamiliar landscape. It seemed as if I might melt into the green horizon. Gravestones burrowing into the hillside like gaping mouths greet me when I arrive. Ivy clings to my arms, sweat drips. I feel nostalgic for summer. I, I want to take off as many articles of clothing as I can. Vivid green leaves unfurl and branches devoid of moisture are scattered. A bamboo broom is left abandoned, the earth drinking in your sweat. Your nation twinkles and shines. I clean the gravestone and finally bring my hands together in prayer. After that, even I could sense the blood connection. Is my ancestor here in this grave? I am your descendant who came wandering under the sun, the unforgiving sun, the cloud-obscured sun, the oppressive sun on the red-stained earth. I felt meek, and with the gently swaying fields at my back, a moment of silence for all humankind. It was a calm day. I talked on the phone to my grandmother in Peru, and when I told her I had visited her family grave, she asked me whether I could find the swing she used, used to, to play, play on, on the as list a little girl. girl. North of Nago, in the village of Ogimi, nestled in lush green, I bought some sake at a store and went to the site of the house my grandmother grew up in, now an empty lot. There were many Taiwan tangerine trees and one sad tree whose name I didn't know. And there was the swing that my grandmother apparently played on before the war. I had a photograph from my relative in Nago. It was a photograph of my grandmother as a young girl, smiling with the charm of a bowl of noodles, her naturally curly hair tied back, dressed in laborer's pants. When I showed Sano this, he stared silently at it, as if gazing at his own child. My grandmother had also said she wanted me to come to Peru to pay my respects to my grandfather's grave, my grandfather and his brothers. A child of immigrants born in Peru who met my grandmother in Okinawa. I had seen the burial of my deceased grandfather. In this place that was now an empty lot, time seemed to have stopped. On the return trip from the cemetery, we stopped in Hinoko. A man known to be a leftist activist with an artificial leg was putting up a tent. He continued his protest activities against the relocation of the military base. On the fence that separates the US military camp and Okinawa, protesters from the mainland chanted and hung protest banners and other creations from, uh, made from signatures of children they'd gathered. But not a single American could be seen on the beach of the US military camp. My friend at NHK had been sent to Hokkaido and he traveled by car from Kushiro to Nemuro. In Nemuro, where he found an active, decrepit pachinko parlor, there was a placard on which was written in large letters, Return the Kiril Islands. But it still isn't clear who that demand should be directed towards. No matter what I thought on the beach, at least there were people who continued the struggle. Someone that wasn't me was staking their lives on it, destroying their lives. Saki Sano exchanged one or two words with the activist. And after some invisible communication took place, he placed his travel bag by his feet, and with a reddened face, he began a peculiar movement. What is he doing on the beach? This rat man who had been banished from Russia. The embassy had sent inquiry after inquiry, a relentless stream of threatening letters. What in the world would have happened to him had he never awakened to self-expression and had simply and quietly lived a bourgeois life, I imagine? The director is going to Peru to see his grandmother, apparently. I prefer to relive my memories alone, 
of when I left Russia. I escaped to Paris and walked that night to avoid people, as if the sun had disappeared. It was gone. I heard about the death of my daughter from my wife I left behind in Russia. Gone. I poured too much sugar in a cafe that stank of urine on the Champs Elysees. Pretty soon, this city would be cloaked in darkness. A thug targeting me for the accusations of treason tried to lure me into a basement, but I rebuffed such invitations. His director, great-grandfather, got on a ship around the time I began making theater in Tokyo. A ship headed to Peru, and he, dreaming of the new world, I went round and round. Tokyo, a Berlin, a Moscow, a Paris, a New York. It was a circuitous route, till I landed in Mexico. Did that ship headed for Peru sway? I pray for the peace of my fellow countrymen who died in the swaying ship. Peru, one, Tayo. Sea vegetable, seaweed, curry powder, green tea, a letter from my mother to my grandmother, a calendar from Japan. My suitcase is packed to the gills. <coughs> when I arrived in Lima, it was midnight. In January, Peru in the southern hemisphere welcomes the height of summer. <coughs> I was expecting someone to pick me up. I threaded my way on a pitch black passageway. The friendly immigration officer was full of smiles and I'm done in two minutes. The customs inspection of my luggage also went smoothly. I'm dizzy by the power of my Japanese passport. I head to the exit. In the dim airport, there are people preparing to leave, people seeing people off, people picking people up, and I who just landed. All of us are overflowing with liveliness. A relative was supposed to greet me, but I don't know who. Someone was supposed to find me, someone who insisted they knew me, even as I had no memory of meeting them before. Nobody is there. I am alone. I wander, then stand still. In my birth town, I am helpless. When I go outside to smoke a cigarette, the cab drivers talk to me in fluent English. No matter how many times I refuse them, the number of my baggage doesn't change. The sky is dark, but I can still tell it was cloudy. And when I inhale, I catch a scent between, between the noise of the parking lot and the smell of gasoline, the dry, fishy scent of this, my other hometown, where I don't understand the language. Standing there, the cab driver's English is restless. Though I can't make sense of the words, I want to steep myself in these nostalgic sounds and smells for a while longer. Sano drags his leg in approaching me as I smoke. Give me a smoke. for a cigarette. Mr. Sano, I didn't know you smoked. Here you go. It's an American cigarette. I bought it duty-free at the airport in Japan. Tobacco of the bourgeoisie. I didn't know if tobacco was bourgeois. There is. Well, it's easy to tax tobacco, so they pile it on, and now tobacco is the most popular item at the duty-free shops. For travelers. Is that so? Is that so? Ho, ho, ho. Mr. Sano, are you still waiting to get into the country? Saki Sano, after leaving Europe, requested entry into the United States, but found himself imprisoned on Ellis Island. This island was a zoo of all the immigration applicants, and it was full of their noises, those who received their papers, each blabbering in their own language. It was a compulsory refugee camp, an island for detention, detention muttered Sano in 1938. You already entered the country. Yes, but my ride isn't here. Your ride? Get in the car, use your voice, and your words. I suppose I'll get a cab, but I just changed my money, and I only have large bills, 100 solars, and the cab driver says he can't make change for that. How much will it cost from the airport to my grandmother's house? I don't know the value of paper money. What if he drops me off in a strange neighborhood with two suitcases, important paperwork, and a laptop thrust into the street in the middle of the night without a phone? Where can I find the certainty that a passerby would be kind to me? Isn't this your hometown? You got into the country, didn't you? Aren't you deeply moved? It may be my hometown, but that doesn't mean someone is going to help me. Uh, of course I'm moved. The airport full of the burnt odor of human bodies. I have no language. I don't know anyone. I've got nothing, nothing at all. In Japan, it's just past noon, and I'm really wide awake because I slept on the plane. Of course we can't sleep. Before I went to Russia, I stopped by America. There, 
all of the important paperwork I needed to attend the International Labor Theater Alliance was stolen. I'm an idiot. In fact, all my clothes, even my hat, were stolen. Still, I was fortunate enough to gain entry. This time, immigration is taking so long, how can I sleep? <coughs> I've become an exile. If I'm deported back to Japan, no doubt a long sentence awaits me. Nobody's coming to pick me up. They called me a traitor. What options do I have? I've got nothing except to live a life eating my own shit. It's surprisingly tasty. <laughs> you stay. Be my guest. Eat it. The political refugee hides in the shadow between the pages of history, and there the shadow sucks him dry. Half of my body has been taken by my nation. But even now, I believe there is a place for me to take action. There must be. It just didn't turn out to be America. So, what of it? I want to revel in a place where the citizens and the government battle with each other in the revolutionary theater. I want to get on a boat and ride it there. Is government support still necessary for the production of art? I mean, what can art like that do for the masses you are fighting for? You will forget so easily a few years after I left the port of Yokohama at the age of 26. I turned 34 and was imprisoned on an arrogant island and I trembled at the possibility that I might be deported back to my home country. I want to create a theater for the next generation. I want to make theater that has nothing to do with politics and war. I want to revel in endless free thought as I grapple with the bodies of actors. I want to run wildly and sweat on the stage. I always thought that you made theater as a means of being politically active. Isn't it a failure to make theater devoid of social significance? I am just making theater. Just want to make theater. We mean different things when we say the word politics, Sana. And he returned to his island prison. <clears throat> Even much later, I still couldn't understand what that word meant. Teatro. I had come to the other side of the planet, and I just wanted to get to my destination as quickly as possible. Every day from the port of Yokohama, apparently, there were travelers, exchange students, future political refugees, immigration applicants and diplomats riding out to sea. My great-grandfather left Yokohama on September 23, 1920. The immigration ship Anyomaru on voyage number 69 arrived in Callao near Lima on November 12. The immigrants <coughs> settled in Callao and later scattered. The airport I'm in right now is in the same Callao. After wandering around the 1,700 square feet of the arrival lobby for 90 minutes, Isabel, a friend of my grandmother, found me, and I was finally reunited with my grandmother. Seeing her grandchild's face for the first time in 20 years, she didn't recognize me. She said I looked so different, different from, from photographs. photographs. I brushed off her comment, laughing that my facial expressions change every day. No, ma no wonder she didn't recognize me. And that moment, for the two of us, became a special funny story we shared. It took an hour by car to reach my grandmother's house in San Borja, where I was born. I loaded my suitcases into the car, and without much conversation, we drove. The streets of Lima at night seemed surprisingly well paved, and the music that played inside the car, winter landscape of the Sugari Straits, was popular with the Japanese Peruvian driver who spoke no Japanese, and he sang along. We watched NHK through satellite broadcast, and Grandma and I yawned. The living room was about 215 square feet and was built by Grandpa, who sold Nissan car parts. The broadcasting station in Tokyo reported damages caused by a snowstorm to us in the southern hemisphere. We watched the morning drama in the evening and singing contests at night. The high concrete block wall surrounding the house is topped by barbed wire. Winged ants, who'd overcome that barrier and entered the house, fall onto the tablecloth. They fly straight into the light fixture and then fall. And as they circle around on the tablecloth, I smush them with our fingers without a sound. I learned how to say chicken in Spanish, pollo. It's cute. 
And, but, and however, are pero. I want to eat pollo, pero I dislike the smell of cilantro, so I give this pollo to the pero. <laughs> On the dining room table, there are, besides the pollo, which is the national food of Peru, pickled <coughs> cucumber, miso soup, white rice, large flavorless fermented soybeans, stir-fried noodles, uh, a fruit that looks like a cherry tomato, and granadilla, that looks like a pomegranate, and is supposedly good for constipation. In the evenings, as we drink Inca Cola, NHK tells us about the Port of Izu tomorrow morning. They're 14 hours ahead of us. And what's for breakfast there? Japanese TV is all about food. Yes, it really is. But we are completely enthralled by that breakfast report. I heard Japanese bread is really, really delicious. delicious, Grandma says. And I think I'd love to bring some with me on my next visit, but it would be difficult. I even imagine packing a baker up very small and bringing him over, but this is all inside my imagination, of course. I'm drinking some weak green tea, and Grandma was sleeping, sitting in her chair. Grandma, uh, you should go to sleep properly in your bed. Oh, yep. You go to sleep too. We're going to go to the Rio Ichi Jinai Recreational Center tomorrow, so we need to leave by 9 a.m. All right, I'll go to bed soon. Good night. Good night. My mother had made me bring a few small bean bags, and I practiced juggling them with Grandma before sleep as an exercise to prevent dementia, but that only lasted three days. And after waking Grandma, who dozed off in front of the TV, I went upstairs to the room where my father grew up and went to sleep on the big bed. My father's computer is still in this room. And the shower is sometimes cold, but that's fine since it's summertime. The scent of the humid, filthy dirt is stirred up by the exhaust of the cars racing down Aviacion Street. The water pressure of the toilet is weak, and often one flush wouldn't catch all the particles. I would smoke cigarettes shirtless and gaze down at Aviacion Street. Cabs would make a right on red. Sirens on police cars echoed, surrounding us from both sides unseen. In the middle of the night, the sidewalks were dimly lit in orange as homeless people and young couples walked, and criminals would escape unseen. I see <coughs> sanitation workers in yellow, water repellent uniforms, pushing huge garbage cans walking. Tomorrow, I will accompany Grandma to her weekly visit to the Ryuichi Janai Recreational Center. I must get to sleep. I lay down in bed and I count the rows of cars immobilized by the huge snowstorm of January 2014, as I saw on NHK. I had dreams all the time, and it was hot and humid, but it wasn't as bad as summer in Japan. I was reminded of the lush green in Ojimi Village in Okinawa. I wonder if it's cold there now. Lima is always cloudy, dusty, a slum town, mountains of fruit, blue tarps for ceiling, bald gray mountains, the monorail under construction, dust, natural tr gas traffic jams, buses, reckless driving, the male voices of barkers calling out. I wonder how Sono has spent the night. A soft pillow, a bed caving in in the middle. Grandma's bed on the first floor was so littered with clothes and photographs, it looked like there was hardly any space to lie down. Grandma, in a floral dress, smoothing out the wrinkles on her face with her palms, of her hands, dragging her right leg a little. Did she always sleep here in the living room chair, all alone, the sound of NHK uninterrupted until late? Three, Ryoichi Jinai Recreational Center. The director, having no opportunity to look at the scenery outside because of Peru Peruvian driver's destructive driving, takes in the smells of the perfumed car interior and the odor of old age as he listens to the Spanish conversation of the Japanese Peruvian meanwhile. The microbus zigzags down the road, chasing a homeless man and child clad in traditional Incan garb in the sidewalk. And in about an hour, it arrives at the, at the Ryoichi Jinai Recreational Center the bus stopped in front of the main entrance like headbangers, and a ramp for wheelchairs is hooked onto the side door for the outside, from the outside. At the entrance, a team of volunteer staff clad in aloha shirt uniforms came to assist 
each senior one by one off the bus, greeting them with warm hugs and kisses. At the second floor reception, each senior took their name tag and paid their 10 solace participation fee. And then over 50 of these elderly folk sat around tables drinking green tea and getting their blood pressure taken. It was almost 11 a.m. This was the sight every morning. Now, this week, next week. I commune to Jinai every Mondays. I introduce the director to my Monday friends with such pride that he seems giddy and embarrassed. Nieto, Nieto. I introduce my grandson to everyone proudly with a smile. At the Ryuichi Jinai Recreational Center, the director, my grandson, watches Jiro Kanmori singing on TV and folds origami and learns how to make tea in a way he's never experienced in Japan with folks who might be the grandmas and grandpas of someone who lives in Okinawa. <coughs> he met a karate master there and he even thought about becoming a volunteer staff there. In celebration of all the January birthdays, all the 70-something, 80-something, 90-something, or 100-something seniors all hugged each other and ate sweet cake. Then we sang songs like Hometown, Spring Creek, That Wonderful Love Once More, The Demon's Pants, and Masao to the accompaniment of a piano played by the wife of a Japanese office worker stationed there. The song, the Flower Blooms, which is the theme song for the NHK Earthquake Relief Program. And a city of it had been made of the Monday Senior Center class singing it at the Bonenkai end of the year party. They were giving out these CDs, and I got one too. A Japanese Peruvian grandpa who can't speak Japanese. Grandma mixes Japanese, Okinawa, Spanish, the grandson explains origami, folds in Japanese, but Mrs. Onaga and Mrs. Chin and frown and tell him, I don't understand it's Japanese. Japanese. <coughs> As she drinks green tea or eat cold tempura, grandma says, I'd like to go to Okinawa one more time, but it's impossible. I'm too old. I'm given up. Grandma's husband died 20 years ago. He was second generation born in Peru, but he returned, or rather went to Okinawa as a teenager and there met grandma. It was the period before the war, and Jinai Ryoichi, who would later build this <coughs> Ryoichi Jinai Recreational Center, was still a boy, obsessed with the adventure comic book popular at the time, which fueled his admiration for immigrants. Why didn't he emigrate? himself. You are famous in the world of economics for founding consumer credit in Japan, but money lending makes me think of pearls. One mustn't say bad things about people who still lend money. After eating a meal at the restaurant called Kitana on the first floor, the grandson felt the urge to tweak the nose of the statue of Mr. Jinai displayed in the foyer. To be honest, I wanted to go abroad. The South Pacific, South America, or Manchuria. I just wanted to go overseas, but I wasn't able to. The war ended in 1945, and in February of the following year, half a year after the end of the war, I went to Hokkaido in a single backpack. I wanted to farm. For someone born in the South, in Shikoku, still is a rarity. As a child, I always dreamed of places where it snowed, and I wanted one day to live in a place like that. Kagawa Prefecture is the smallest prefecture in Japan, and Hokkaido is the largest. That's why I went from the boredom in Kagawa to Hokkaido. But when I got there, there was a few food shortage and job shortage. Even the farmers were eating scrap rice. There was no work, no, no. I looked, and there was nothing. 
It was right after the war, so there was no work. No job to work, no food to eat. In the end, I had to go back to Shikoku. The young man with his broken dreams built up a large consumer blending company and promised himself to support Japanese communities abroad, create programs for Japanese war orphans in China to return to Japan. And now he lives his dream of growing mangoes in the land of Hokkaido, raising cattle and flying all over Japan. The statue of you represents the bottomless thanks that these grandmas and grandpas have had once a week. These folks who are scattered through the city gather together for a meal. They come together once a week to chat with each other. Their sons have gone to Japan and their daughters have moved to the States. The songs of their faraway homeland etched in their genes overflow in this building. Who cares what Japan has to say? Here, time continues to flow. <coughs> Why did the man with such lending power, ability to take action, influence, become a politician? In the afternoon, everyone fell asleep into, to the music of Ikoso Yoshi. So the grandson returned to the statue in the foyer and tapped his chest. I still want to go to South America. But my age being what it is, there's nothing I can do. The task of, of completing the farm I started building in Hokkaido still remains. My time is limited. I'm almost 90. My legs and my stamina aren't what they used to be. So I have no choice but to give up on my South American dream. But I've decided I'm going to keep working all over Japan even if I become bound to a wheelchair. I'll die in a hotel while on a business trip. I feel that kind of destiny awaits me. What would happen hmm? if I'd gone? I've heard bloody stories of deceit about politics, immigration policy, the sweat that oozes from the body and dirt. If I'd gone, I would have suffered the same hardships and troubles I've asked myself countless times whether I would have been able to endure that much suffering. I merely wanted to go abroad. Startled. The grandson removed his hand from the statue and returned to the room where they were singing, close your hands, open your hands, and stared at the movements of the elderly, their slow gait, their hips, their backs. The grandmas were raising their voices, opening their hands wide, smiling for the however hundredth or thousandth time in their lives, repetition and accumulation. Their hunched backs have pores that have produced tens of thousands of liters of sweat, and their white hair that have been cut over and over. They have stained scalp. The scale of one's life might be defined by the size of one's body. Can we really look at the world outside of our own body's mobility level, he wondered. There ought to have been something recorded in his own body, but the grandson could not unearth it. At the end, they sang the Jinai Recreational Center song, and in the evening, they boarded the microbus with its violent driving, and one by one, they scattered across the city of Lima. Mr. Teira, dressed in an Adidas track suit, made a worker open the gates to his big house, and then, slowly, as if he were floating, he lurched forward and went inside his house, slowly, as if he were floating. The seniors, one by one, got off the bus at their respective stops and disappeared. <coughs> Four, grave, visit, and bus. The next day, my grandson and I took a cab. I don't ride taxis by myself. It's too scary, I guess. 
I've heard stories about being robbed in a strange alley. I kept our conversation inside the car to a minimum and watched the street outside with, through sunglasses. It was an unusually bright sunny day for Lima. We visited his great-grandparents and grandfather's graves. The bright blue sky and the green ground, clean water, civil engineers. When I held my grandson's hand, I was no longer walking alone. We traced the names of the gravestones, brought our hands together, and I tell them that their descendants have come. In the afternoon, when we returned to the house on Adesion, my grandson stuck my house key onto the outside of his belt, inside of his belt, put some change in his pocket, a hundred soles bill in his shoe, and said he'd be back before dark and went out. When he reached Andamo Street, which intersect Aviacion Avenue, he got on a bus at the side of the mall built by American Capital. Inside the mall, there's a Burger King and KFC and Kentaro Sushi. Andamo Street is very noisy. There's more sweat and hair than people. Piles and piles of bricks. And gas permeates the air. Besides the buses and the micros, micros, there are wagon buses called combis, and they were speeding down the street, buzz past the cars and taxis, but suddenly stop in intersections. Barkers on the bus shout out the bus's destination and beckon wildly collecting customers. The crowded combi buses even seat two customers in its passenger seat. In this moment, my grandson jumped on a micro, a regular bus. He sat down with his hands on his lap as he was jostled by the bus, pushing its way through this raging street. He, could, he would give one soul each or applaud the musicians, rapping, and guitarists who would board the bus en route and play for tips. And suddenly, there was a teenage girl sitting across the aisle, her black hair pulled back with a smile like a tomato against her dark skin, who was chatting cheerfully with her mother. The energy of her legs that emerged like noodles out of her white shorts, the moisture of her breast reminded him of crisp Celery. The downy hair on her arms would give energy back to the sun, hidden behind some clouds. This was exactly what that Japanese pop song was referring to uh, with the lyrics about how you feel like you understand something about life when you're swaying along with the bus and the grandson reveled in this repetitive, suspended days spent with his grandma that connected him to his ancestors and in his mouth he would keep the taste of the potatoes he ate in Miraflores with his cousin Eddie, who would visit once in a while. The people waiting for the bus, the middle-aged man with his hand raised who looks like he's been living on the street, women in red trying to stop the buses with languid gestures, mothers with children clambering aboard the middle doors of the moving bus all on the same brown and gray road. Everyone is lazy and energetic. <laughs> he was planned to get off on the other side of Metropolitano Station in Angamos. Tac, tac, someone pats him on the shoulder from behind. Where it started. But he started, <laughs> terrible accent. He was, he has no idea what's going on. There is a man with a sallow face and black hair in, in sitting behind him. The bus continues to skid down the road, making the sound of tearing rubber. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Um, ud Japanese? Uh, Japanese? Uh, no. You are Japanese. Oh, no. Wonderful. <laughs> I was looking for a Japanese person. Uh. <laughs> this is wonderful. I I am so pleased to meet you. When I told that Peruvian girl back there that I was looking for a Japanese person, she said that you were probably Japanese, though it's difficult to tell. So I was wondering, is he? But this is wonderful. I was looking for a Japanese person. <coughs> Are you on vacation? Um, no, sir. To be honest, I'm from Japan, looking for a Japanese person, and I'm distributing these flyers. Here, I want you to take this. And read it for starters. What now? Have you read it? Oh, oh, 
now? Yes, of course. Between you and me, it's really better if you read it. You want redemption, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Do you plan to go anywhere after this? How about joining me for a meal at a restaurant nearby as a social gathering? I'll make it worth your time. I've been looking for you, you know. You can read comic books there, too. No. Don't turn me down! I put a lot of effort into drawing those! Oh, oops. Excuse me, I, I, I turned into a comic book artist. Huh. <laughs> no. What are you planning to do now? Are you riding this bus, giving up on life like an old man? Spending the evening in a daze? You don't have anything. I'd love to draw the rest of the story by myself. Oh, no. I turned into a comic book artist again. Uh, oh, no, no, no. It's not your problem. <sighs> so, how about a meal? Let's get off this rotten bus. There's a restaurant called Fuji nearby. It's not bad. I'm sure you don't have anything pressing, right? I have to be back before sundown, so... Then I'll show you a sun that never sets. Listen, <laughs> everything goes haywire because you put yourself in the center. You've heard of putting others before yourself, haven't you? You must destroy yourself to serve the public good. It doesn't matter what you see in front of your eyes. You are suspicious of who I am and what I'm planning to do to you, but there's no reason for to worry, man. Most of the people in this world are disadvantaging themselves for the sun that never sets. To be clear, we seek so eagerly a sun that never sets that we destroy ourselves. If only they knew how, they would find such a sun easily. They say that people who are no good at studying are simply lacking a productive method of studying. In other words, I'm offering you a lecture on efficiency, and on this theme, together, we'll explore what is the fastest, cheapest, and, and simplest solution. All you have to do is close your eyes and do exactly as I say. If, if what you desire is an eternal slumber, that is fine as well. I even have the power to manipulate your dreams. It's easy for me to show you what you want to see, but I'm sure that's not what you're looking for, because you put so much effort into serving the public good. I can tell by looking in your eyes, but it hasn't gone well. I understand you, comrade. It's all right for you to not be yourself. Don't think about yourself. The reason why we suffer for other people's lives is because we are attached to ourselves, but that's not right. Um, there's no need for our lives to be scraped away like that. Well, that's, that's not right. Um, come. Anyway, let's have a meal at Fuji Restaurant. I'll tell you which comic you ought to read, too. That is how my grandson was taken by a religious recruiter. <laughs> Off the bus at Andama Station in Metropolitano and to a combi called by the recruiter towards Fuji. The combi is crammed full of sweaty Japanese people in the color of dirt. They all carried large backpacks from which hung dirty cups, their hair overgrown and damaged, all of them facing straight ahead with perfect posture, staring at a single point, out of focus. In those eyes were a vacant hope, and it was calm inside the car, except for the sound of the engine and the noise of the tires skidding on the rough asphalt. The recruiter's finger was lifted in midair with a smile on his face, moving his finger as if conducting an orchestra. And though the grandson felt uncomfortable with the scene, he couldn't make eye contact with anyone and stared blankly at the back of the passenger seat. The traffic outside was noisy and it didn't feel like any taxi would do with him and everything became a still time and space. Oh, by the way, an NHK world, due to over um, copyright issues, they're permitted to replace video with still, but still broadcast and audio. The, the video is hidden, and there's no proof that it existed. Um, the sound is huge. 
every event has a sound. The sound creates. The sound of guns, the sound of Eden, the sound of praying, everything and anything. Sound falls in the, to, into the gap between words, crawls around, lies down and then disappears. You scold an actor and the sound of the direction is heard, then disappears and then a new actor and director come along. The sound of light and instrument, the sound of the audience adjusting himself on his seat, the crowd, people gathered in a public space, the sounds and people who will probably disappear, still remain echoing in our ears. Theater. I went to a theater in my town to see a play called All of Humankind is Tilting to the Right, parentheses, phallocentricism. <laughs> the director of the production, a man who spoke Spanish with an Asian accent, came dragging his right leg and sat next to me. His hat was rather dusty and stained, and his cane was black. Today I saw what could be considered teatro for the first time. I was surprised. I, took, I bought a ticket for the price of 20 bottles of Coca-Cola, and when I get to the theater, everyone besides me is in formal dress. The bearded guy in that expensive suit, the cultured lady speaking a, myster uh, the cultured lady speaking a mysterious language. Where do you see them walking around in our town? What mountain did they come down from? The play itself was an absurd comedy about a theater director who doesn't want to direct anymore, and he can't control his sex drive, and because he's too serious, he goes crazy, and though he finds support from other directors, he flails around in different situations. The play had a kind of European or American sense of levity, and yet it had, it was like, hey, let's think about the relationship between politics and art, and I found it pretty laughable, but what the heck was this, really? Seeing this play, even applying it to my daily life, doesn't even nourish my shit. <laughs> if you're going to make me laugh, just make me laugh. In fact, I'll have to resign myself to being jealous of those stinking rich people sitting next to me who seem to always be eating thick steaks and drinking coffee. That Asian director's clothes were terribly worn, and though he is apparently doing quite well where he is based, I should have asked his opinion on those patrons. Is this really how it should be? Can you accept this play as a side dish to their dinner? Where are the ordinary people on the street? And I, perhaps, am not an ordinary person either. I can only sit in the audience, straighten my back, and gaze at the movement of the actors on stage.
probably going to take, I think, about 15 or so minutes now to have a, a discussion about the play that we've just heard. And um, uh, I'll introduce the panelists in a minute. But um, just, uh, I, I saw this play two years ago when it premiered in, in Yokohama in Japan. And I saw it at the uh, Tokyo Performing Arts meeting. And um, I'm, I'm one or two of us in the room saw it there. And, I was really struck by it. It was a really remarkable play, and I, I really congratulate you on a, on a wonderful play. Um, it, it was a play that I think is, uh, for me anyway, really exciting because it begins to explore Japan from uh, the perspective of Japan in the world. Uh, it introduces some of the perhaps lesser known history of Japan, Japan's history of immigration prior to World War II. Uh, its engagement with the modern theatre and modern arts, uh, really very strong engagement with uh, the modern arts prior to World War II, and the history of artists. And, uh, and this is um, something that I think in some ways has, 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 has disappeared from the memory of, of many Japanese people. And certainly, as somebody who sometimes teaches Japanese theatre, it's not commonly discussed in, in the theatre itself. Um, so, and also a, a play that deals with uh, the contemporary realities of Japanese society as, a, as an immigrant society. This is also something that uh, is not discussed very broadly in the, in the theatre in Japan, and this was also something remarkable. So, um, you know, I was very taken by the way that this play, in a way, um, repositions Japan and, and, and brings it into a kind of conversation with the, the history of the 20th century in some ways. And, I think we've had some of those experiences encapsulated in, in the play today. So um, that's just how I was introduced to the play. But um, uh, we might just begin by introducing Sarah Hughes, who directed the play, um, and uh, Aya Ogal, who is uh, the translator of this play and also many, many other plays into English from <coughs> Japanese. And we've already been introduced um, to the playwright uh, Yudai Kamisato. Um, and uh, before I ask you, Sarah, about your translation of the play, oh, sorry, your, your direction of the translation of the play, I'd like to just begin to ask you a little bit about uh, your family history and yourself and how that uh, connects to the play. My father is from Okinawa, and Kamisato is a last name that is specific to that area. And my great grandfather uh, was from my family immigrated to Peru. Um, and it was a time in Japanese history where there was a, a large movement towards um, immigrating to America, North America, and as well as South America. Um, で、あの、えっと、ま、ただその、え、実際の出稼ぎでお金を稼いで戻ってくるつもりが、あの、実際行ってみたら話がまた違って、あの、ま、ほとんど近隣というか、あ、政治的にキリステられたみたいな歴史
、であの今の日本というのはほとんどそのあのアメリカのように移民で成り立っている国ではないんですけどあの逆にその移民を排出してたということもあのほぼ知識として一般的ではないかなと。Although, uh... Unlike America, Japan is not a nation created by immigrants, but there is a, a significant history of Japanese people immigrating abroad, and it's a part of history that is not well known generally. そこであの佐野関の,あの,そのメキシコ演劇の父になった方っていうのを本を、まあ、ペルーで読んだりしててあのでちょうどそのヨーロッパの,あの演劇とこうよくを見に行ったりする機会が増えてきた時に、まあ、あの現実社会とかこう政治とかに対して一体何がな,なんかすごく無力感を持っていたのでそれをこうあのチャンプをミックスしたっていうのが成り立ちです。Um, and also while I was in Peru I picked up a book about、uh, Sano Seki,、uh, the Mexican Japanese theater maker、um, and his life and times. And this also coincided with the time in my life where I had been、uh, Had more chances, opportunities to see theater from Europe. And I really felt a kind of、uh, impotence of theater in modern society. So in this play, I was kind of exploring the extremes of、um, uh, intention of theater. Thank you. Thank you very much.、Um, I was very much taken by the, the comment in the play、uh, Can we look outside of ourselves? It's one of the lines that one of the characters uses in the play where、um, they're starting to talk about, I guess, the possibility of、uh, looking at oneself in relationship to history. And、uh, I wanted to ask you, as a translator, is that something that you relate to as, a, as somebody who's one living between two cultures but also translating from two different languages? Are you kind of looking outside of yourself when you're doing that kind of process? Or is that,、uh, Um, or is that too clever? <laughs> um, um, I, I've never thought of it that way. I really feel like,、um, really like a filter. You know, I feel like I, I, I take in work and then it passes through me and becomes something else.、Um, I think that as a bicultural person, I do frequently see myself. Um, outside of any given、uh, community.、Um, and I, I think that does relate to my、um, work as a translator for sure. Sarah, silence and absence and gaps、mm -hmm. constantly appear in this play.、Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps references to maybe sense of dislocation.、Uh, possibly there's 
a kind of very trans-historical approach to time in this play, mm -hmm. uh, jumping from one place to another and one time to another. Um, um, Seiki Sano is a real character, he's a real figure from history who suddenly pops up in this play with a kind of manifesto for uh, a kind of Marxist political theater. And also in preparation, I, I, I read that he is the, the, the Japanese person who translated the Internationale into Japanese. So, um, uh, so he's quite a significant figure in the leftist theater of the pre-war period. But, but this question of gaps and silences um, it, it's possibly an aesthetic that uh, is something that is seen in the Japanese theatre quite a lot, but not in other theatres. How, how do you come, as a director, how do you come to that kind of, um, that kind of writing, that kind of idea about space and time? Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's definitely difficult with, um, with doing... I feel, uh, reading this play, I felt so strongly that I wanted to see it fully staged. Um, and of course, there wasn't time. Um, doing it as a reading is uh, only sort of a, a first pass at what I think the, especially this play, um, what it really, how it can resonate. Um, uh, I think especially because there are those, there, it, it, on the page, it's, it's very dense. You know, it's this, these, these long, um, pieces of text with, with sort of these enjambments and, and line breaks. And so I think we were trying to play with um, being able to hear that, tr trying to hear that language um, when, you know, I think a, a reading format is sometimes uh, can be better suited to something that's a little bit more dialogue heavy. Um, and so that was definitely, uh, that was definitely a challenge. Um, and definitely playing with the, with that sort of, um, being between places and times, um, I think so uh, clearly from you know uh, Yudai's family history and and the the history of the protagonist, um, he's in this moment of being kind of in transit, like perpetually jet lagged, like perpetually waking up in this and not being sure where he is, um, uh, and and similarly, like th those are the moments when someone like Sekisano, who's from another time, might appear. There's all these moments about dreams. Um, so I think when we were, when we were uh, working on it in the you know, small amount of rehearsal time we had, that was, that was definitely what we were sort of talking about the most and how to, um, how to try to differentiate those dreams and those um, uh, apparitions uh, from a more, this is right, happening right now, uh, those those this is happening right now moments like the religious recruiter thing at the end is one of the the only moments that it feels like this is sort of present mm -hmm. I guess and and so much of the rest of it is like inside this floating dream space um, of like you said transnationality and trans historicity or yeah so definitely yeah thank you um, back to um, Kamisato-san, um, I'm interested, in, is this play is also a kind of manifesto for theatre, or maybe it's more than one, maybe there's two or three manifestos. So, um, of course, theatre in Japan has a long history of meaning something. In the pre-war period, the modern theatre was very much connected with uh, uh, an experimental theatre movement, but also a political theatre movement. After the war, we had a return to a kind of Brechtian theatre. Then we had the 1960s, <coughs> where theatre took on another kind of political tenor. And then somehow, um, uh, since then, we've had a series of uh, very complex relationships about, uh, sorry, a very complex arguments about theatre and its relationship to society. Some artists saying, yes, theatre is connected to society. Some artists saying theatre is more about entertainment. And as a, as a young or mid-career artist, you're making a very strong statement here about theatre and its politics. Um, so I wondered if you could speak a little bit more about uh, uh, the role of theatre and politics in this play. そうですね、僕はあの、ま
2年ほど前からあの2年ほど前にこの作品を書いて、えっと、その時にこれはあの演劇ではなくて政治をやろうっていうことを言い出したんですけどその自分にとっての政治っていうものをずっと考えていてそれは多分その政治家がやっているあの政治っていうものとは違って、えっと、あのこ,ここにいない人の想像することみたいな簡単に言うとそういうことが政治だなというふうに考えるようになりました。So, two years ago, when I was writing this play, I wasn't writing it thinking I want to make a piece of theater. I was thinking I want to make politics. And the politics that I wanted to practice wasn't the kind of politics that politicians engage in, but rather a, a, I was investigating what it would mean, what does personal politics mean? And for me, it meant evoking the presence of people who are not in this room. あの特に今日本ではあの戦後、えー、と太平洋戦、えー、と第二次世界大戦を70年以上経過してあのその戦争体験をした人たちがもうほとんどいなくなってきているところであのこの先どういうあの社会とかあのこうかん他の国との関係を取っていくのかとか、まあ、国のそのそものとかあのえー、とを考えていかないといけないところに来てると思うんですけれども。It's been、uh, seven, over 70 years now since the end of World War II, and in Japan, there are, are hardly any, there are fewer and fewer people who actually lived through the wartime experience. So, Japan is in a moment right now where we really have to look at the future and Uh, have a consciousness about what kind of relationship do we want to have with the, all the other countries in the world? So, in that case, the sensual experience of 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 the s e n s 膨大な記録だったり膨大なストーリーっていうのはあるわけでそれをこうあの他の人間から他の人間の話を聞いて想像するっていうことがあの重要でかつ非常に演劇の持つあの性質でもあるなと思ってます。And if, if we can only learn from history... By hearing about experiences directly from the people who experienced it, then the time for us to learn about war is coming to an end. However, these larger stories and these larger themes still remain. And if the stories can be passed on from person to person, if we can still learn from these stories,、uh, not firsthand but secondhand, That I felt like is where the true power of theater lies. まあそれが政治的だと言いたいのとあのと思っているのとその俳優の存在がまさにその自分当事者じゃない俳優が当事者の代わりにストーリーをこうメッセンジャーとして届けるっていうあの横流しするみたいな意味であの。So that was my kind of、uh, investigation to, into personal politics.、Um, and in the theater, we have these actors who are channeling other characters, other stories, other times.、Um, and that was the way I was looking at theater when I was、uh, creating this piece. Thank you, thank you.、Um, Now, I'm really aware of time here because there's going to be another play reading at 6 p.m., but I would like to take maybe just one or two questions from the audience and、uh, just very, very quick questions.、Uh, so there's one there. But keep your questions brief, please, because、um, we will have to finish by within five minutes. Okay.、Uh, I recently saw the making of RAM, 
the backstory of Rand. And I kept on hearing Shakespeare's metaphors being, uh, and, and just that experience of Shakespeare. How much did Shakespeare, uh, are you aware of Shakespeare and how much have you, uh, that influenced you? Hi, I'm Rick. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. And uh, I think we'll follow that up. Uh, uh, in a discussion after the after the session, but indeed that pl that uh, film is very much shaped based on Shakespeare's. Uh, 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 the first play I ever read was actually Shakespeare's Macbeth, um, and I read it in English. Yeah. I couldn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most of us can't either. So, um. Is there one more question? Very brief, uh, otherwise we'll just wrap it up and let the, the uh, um, helpers pack up and set up for the next session. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming along this afternoon. <laughs> thank you for your uh, And uh, a final round of applause for the performance this afternoon. <laughs> thank you.